Hello, people of the internet. It's me again, Antoinette van Graan, here for another book review. So, for the next couple of weeks, I want to tackle a series. This series is the Demon Cycle series by Peter B. Brett, starting with The Painted Man. So, I had a journey with this series. The first book I loved. Literally immediately got the second book. I could not. I could not let the story go. Second book. I loved. Same thing. I had to have more. And then the third book was... It was okay. It was okay. I don't want to get into it here. It was, a, it was okay to bad. The fourth book... I actively hated, but I was invested in some of the side characters and invested in some of the minor characters, and I was just like, okay, let's just let's just see it through to the end. I've gotten this far. Fingers crossed that magic can come back, and I pushed on. The fifth book, I did not even finish. Um, once again, don't want to get into it too much here, but there was a scene where I actively stopped and said, if this happens without any cost to the character, without anything, any consequences, without anything going wrong, I will put down this book. I'm so sick of this bullshit. And guess what happened? I read the scene, I read the next scene, just to see if my consequences weren't just a little bit late. Nope, nothing. And I put it down, I think I was like three quarters of the way through, and I just, I just couldn't anymore. I couldn't. With, no, 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 no. So, we'll get to that. We'll get to the fifth book. I don't want, as I said, I really don't want to get into it now. Because... I really loved the first book, and I, I wish that magic had continued. So, this series is high fantasy, which means that it's a fantasy depicting a world that is different from our own, usually with magic and things. There is a magic system in this series, and at least for the first couple of books, it's a hard magic system system with set rules, consequences, and limitations. The premise of this book is fascinating. In this world, every night, everybody knows when, the, when dusk is coming. Because when the sun sets and the last rays of light disappear, this foggy, grey-black smoke starts appearing everywhere and demons rise from that fog. And they're monstrous, vicious creatures, sometimes called Corlings or Alagai as well. And their whole culture, these people's whole culture is built around the rise of the Corlings at night. Because they can't fight these things. All they can do is try to defend themselves as much as possible. So the culture is built around this problem, this threat. That has no solution the population is low because every now and then towns just get completely wiped out there are little demons that spit fire at you there are um great big hulking rock demons there are field demons that are really fast and kind of agile and cat-like there are tree demons that hide in trees and then jump down at you so it's, it's well developed. High fantasy, strong magic system, good solid premise that permeates the whole world. This is the genre I love. This is, this is my jam. Okay, then when we get to style and pacing, I'm sure you've noticed I don't have the book. I read this on audiobook, so I need to mention that and I also need to mention um, what I thought of the narrator. So this book was narrated brilliantly. I really 
love the accents he was able to pull off. I love the the way that these different voices made every character seem unique. Because sometimes the voices for narrators can be very similar. I it just it made the story come alive for me, and I could almost start recognizing regional accents and how cool is that? So yeah, I was completely immersed in this world. So then when we get to the actual style of pacing of this, the pacing is really well done. There is deep, complex world building in the story, but it never feels like you're just getting an exposition dump on you. The characters know their world, and they kind of assume you do too, and the author assumes you are not an idiot and you can pick up on this. The structure of this is interesting. It's almost like a Marvel cinematic universe feel. Because there are multiple characters, but it's not in the same way as A Song of Ice and Fire does it. In A Song of Ice and Fire, it's one character, one chapter, one character, one chapter, and they all link in the same place or in the same story and you know more or less what's going on but the point of view switch constantly here you spend a lot of time in one point of view and then you jump and you're in another point of view and then you jump and you're in another point of view for a long time and only when you know all the points of view involved you rapidly jump from one to the other um so it really helps you to build a stronger connection with your pov character and really get to know them so once you've got to, to know your POV character and you've jumped and you've jumped, now you have three POVs. You have three protagonists, but they're far apart. They're on the other side of the world. They have different lives. They haven't made contact yet. And then there's the big team up and they meet and it is so satisfying. The structure of this made me just, made me so happy. So, getting into the sugar and the vinegar, sugar of this is the world, I love the premise, I love the way it's integrated into the rest of the world, it's fantasy, medieval, the classic type of setting you expect, and then just everything has to be built around demons, cities have to be a day apart because you can't travel overnight really. The people who do travel between the cities are trained for years and years in fighting demons in taking care of themselves in building protective circles to keep themselves safe at night and and they're the bravest most respected people in the society so the vinegar in this is a bit weird it's the fight scenes there sometimes it's so much detail that you feel like you're there and sometimes it's almost skimmed over they bashed heads, or it's just, I, I like my fight scenes detailed and intricate, and I want to taste the blood and feel the sweat, and ah, uh, and I just, I'm not, I'm not getting this most of the time, but maybe that's part of a problem that they just, they don't stand a chance against the demons, so, yeah, but the fight scenes were sometimes great, Sometimes, meh. Would I recommend this book just before we hop into spoilers? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you guys. On the one hand, I loved it. I really loved it. On the other hand, it's a bit of a Game of Thrones situation. The book is good, but the series has a bad ending. Game of Thrones has a bad ending, or the song, A Song of Ice and Fire, starting with Game of Thrones, has a bad ending because it doesn't have an ending yet. This has a bad ending because I, I just, I couldn't, I, the books just get not progressively worse, but they just fall off in quality, and I can't explain why. I can explain what went wrong, but I don't know how. It was the same writer. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, 
I don't know. Yo, this is up to you. Is it worth having a good story if the ending is just not that satisfying? Yeah. Okay, now we can talk. Spoiler section. So, how the magic and the world integrate in this is Ward. That's probably why the other title for this book is The Ward of Man. So, how this works is they paint these pictures on poles and things and set them up in a perimeter around the yard or around the house. And then those poles or the pictures link up with each other and they create a magical barrier. So we quickly learn that the way the information about the magic is spread is done badly and not every farmer is really good at ward and if wards are the difference between life and death it's really important to be good at them but they're not so they check the wards each night but they're not great at this and so the night comes when the wards fail and Wards fail often in this world, and people are burned alive and killed by the demons, and the demons are ferocious. They just attack. They don't care. They don't care about themselves. They don't care about... They will fight each other for a human corpse. They... Ugh. I guess that's why it could fall into horror fantasy. It's, it's rough. It's violent when a person gets raped at or killed by a demon, and it happens often. And it's interesting that when you go from town to town, the magic that they use is different because they have no real way of spreading information because the night shuts them off from each other. They can't just spend a day and a night walking to the other town. There's no real communication in between except for the messengers. And the messengers are revered, but also kind of feared because they are the people that can stand in the naked night. And that's scary. Are they not demons? The only people who can stand outside at night are demons. So it's kind of a thing like that. And it's, it's, I love the way that the world building really supports this great fear that everybody is facing the whole time. Then we get into the characters. The first character we have a point of view from is Arlen Bells. He is a farm boy, and we we start with him in in the town, in the farm, and the wards fail, and unfortunately because of that, his mother dies, and that starts him on a journey of trying to become a messenger and starts his real motivation for finding the battles and finding a way to fight back. So Arlen is really brave, really smart, but he's distant. He's very emotionally cut off. He has adopted parents, but they don't really know much about him and his history. He has a girlfriend for a while, and then she says something to slightly piss him off, and he's gone. He just, he just leaves. And he has this yearning for freedom and fighting Alagai. Or fighting demons that that's his thing so his whole thing his motivation is freedom and he feels like he's been caged in his whole life because he has to stay protected from the demons and he just wants out he wants out and he wants to beat them down he wants to beat them for killing his mother he wants to kill them for killing other people and he wants to save the human race almost like the chosen one that they have in the canon in the Bible of this world. There are legends that the Deliverer will come again. So it kind of plays on that chosen one trope, even though Arlen does not believe he is the Deliverer. He doesn't want to be your Deliverer. We are all Deliverers. We're not going to sit around waiting for some chosen one to come and save us. We're saving ourselves. And he puts a spear in every man's hand and we're going to fight. So through Arlen, we learn how the messengers work, which is arguably the most important system in this world. 
we learn how magic is taught and distributed and he learns a lot more about how the magic works so then we get to learn as well and he's the, our adventurous guy he goes on long treks and he fights demons and he does things and he is definitely the main driver of the plot nothing happens if not for all and bales so our second character is leisha paper surname paper because her father made paper go figure and she's a girly girl And on the one side, it's nice to see that we can have a strong woman without her having to kick butt. But she's also a bit annoying. She cries all the time about everything. And she has that thing that they sometimes give to women in stories, especially like the main female. You have to be the mother. You have to be the moral center and that's really what she is Nisha is very principled she she sticks to rules and she enforces them harshly on herself and on other people she expects certain things and certain moral things and she's very sympathetic at the same time but she definitely sticks to her basics uh flawless except for her nagginess and the thing that she cries a lot which I'm glad we don't have to go into the melodrama. There's no point where we have to sit and listen to her moaning. It just said, and then Nisha cried, which I am so thankful for. Through Nisha, we also get a sense of the mundane. We get a sense of the everyman. She's in another small village, and she is taken on as an apprentice herb gatherer at the very start. And then we learn about the technologies of the time. Now, a herb gatherer is sort of like a physician or a doctor. They get called in when you're sick, when this woman is pregnant and doesn't want to be, and when this woman is not pregnant and really wants to be. So they do all that type of stuff. So they, it seems just really grounded compared to Arlen Bell, the political, the complicated, the everything. It just, it's grounded and it's, it's nice. Just since the world is honestly my favorite part of the series as a whole, I really appreciate it just living in it. So, next we get to another passive character who's sort of just living his life. He has no grand agenda like Arlen. He's more like Leisha, just the everyman. And this is Roger Hargrip. He's called Hargrip because um, as a toddler, his parents got attacked his house got broken into by the demon and a demon bit off half of his hand so he has like two or three fingers missing and that's why they call him half group because he's half group so he's a jongler which is like the bard of this world he goes around singing music entertaining people telling them stories and they travel around a bit uh he is mentored by alex sweetsong who is another older jongler who can sing very beautifully. And uh, Roger soon learns he has a particular talent for music and playing music, even though he has a couple of fingers missing. As we get to see the political from his point of view. We are in the city with Roger and Sweet Song, and we get to see how the law, so the, how the nobility is and how they react to the demons and that it's much less of a problem for them because they have castle walls and then the other people are in the way and then their own fort walls and then the keeps are like the most securely warded place in for miles so we can see how the demons are much less so of a threat to them but they don't really have the threat to their personal safety in the same way that the other villagers have. So Roger is just a little sweetheart. He's the youngest character. I think by the end of the book, he's still just 18. And he's funny and he's sweet as sugar. He also has a lot of trauma to deal with, but it never goes into the melodramatic. It just goes into the deeply sympathetic. He 
feels like everybody in his life has died for him. His father died for him, his mother died for him, and later, Alex Sweetgrass also dies for him. He, they all are killed by demons, but they die in Roger's defense. And so he has these tokens that he carries with him to remind him of the people he has lost. And then whenever he feels frightened, he goes and grabs, at some point it's a lock of hair, at some point it's a medallion, then he goes and grabs that and it gives him strength to remember the people he's lost. And it's a, it's a really nice way of showing grief and dealing with grief, even though you kind of get on with your life. So, because of the structure, our plot also kind of jumps a bit. We meet Arlen, go with him for a bit. We meet Misha, we meander with her for a while. And then we meet Roger and we're with him for a shorter time. And then we start jumping between them. Because now you know what's going on. You know who's who, you can get... Okay. You know who's who, you know what's going on. And... Then the plot really kicks into gear. Like, introduction's done, we go in. And Arlen goes to Krasia. Now, Krasia is this very, I don't know if it's stereotypical or badly stereotypical, extremist Arabic type land. It's definitely built on the culture of Saudi Arabia, at least how it's seen from outsiders, and then it's turned up to the ultimate extreme. So he goes there, and it's a, it's a brutal land. Uh, the women are worth nothing, and the men who can't fight are worth almost less. But they're different. They're different from the the Greenlanders. The, that's where Arlen and Misha and them come from. They're different from a, them in that the Croatians fight the demons. Every night they build ward circles to trap the demons inside so that when the sun comes up and they're trapped, the light shines on them and they burn and they die. So they're the only people we've ever met who are fighting back against this. And obviously Arlen Mr. Freedom Fighter himself loves them. He loves that they fight back and he fights with them and he learns their craft and he gets the nickname Pa Chen. Chen is outsider and Pa is brave. So he gets the nickname Brave Outsider because they see the Greenlanders as cowardly because they don't fight the demons. So Arlen goes to Krasia and he goes searching for the old fighting wards. The wards of legend, the wards that can kill a demon. The wards that you paint on a sphere or paint on a rock and all of a sudden it's magical and it's powerful. And he finds them. He finds this old shaggy raggedy map and he follows it out into the desert. Into who knows where, he just, he just goes. And he finds it and he digs up the grave of Kaji, the last deliverer. And he buys the spear and the crown and he takes it to the Persians and they're like, and, and he tells them, you should be the first people to witness this. You should stand with me. We should copy these spears. We should copy this crown and we can fight them because you have been fighting them. You deserve this more than my people do. And he fights and nobody believes him at first, but then the demons die. The spear works. Magic. Fox fly things it's it's mind-blowing and it's done brilliantly and then Arlen's old best friend a Croatian king betrays him he has him beaten and he throws him out in, onto the sand to die And we're pretty sure this is the end of Arlen Bales. He's just a man after all. So, 
Honor uses his messenger training and he survives and it's tense. It's tense the whole time because, okay, now he has this, but he has no food and he, he can't, he can't survive this. And what he does is he carves tattoos into his skin. So he, he tattoos himself with walls. And this is why he is later called the Painted Man. And it's the first time when, where we get a bit of an OP character, a, power, a character that becomes too powerful almost. But it works with Arlen right now because he's really fighting against this. He's lost his humanity now. He looks like a demon and he starts eating demon flesh and it, it changes him. He feels like he is losing his humanity. And then we move away from him and we go back to the humans. And it's it's a bit like you wonder, is he now a demon? Are we what is has he died? What but then they meet up and Leisha and Roger find Arlen just wandering in the woods and he doesn't tell them his name and we're not from his point of view but Arlen tattooed himself and this is a tattooed man walking in the woods killing demons. That sounds like an Arlen thing to do and it is Arlen obviously. And they put it together, and it's great because the tension is there the whole time. Are they going to figure it out? Is he going to save them? Is he going to spread the wards? Like, it's dramatic tension. And it's almost my favorite kind of tension, when you know something that the characters don't, and you just want to shake them. But shaking a book doesn't really work. So, that's kind of where we leave this, and it's hanging there, and we're like, What's going to happen to the Greenlanders? What's going to happen to the Quasians? What's going to happen to Arlen and Leisha and Roger and everybody and the side characters? I kind of define them as part of the world. And they're brilliant. Wanda Cutter and Garrett Cutter. And they're just Arlen's family back home. and They feel so rich. Even though you don't get to spend a lot of time with them. They feel real they feel tangible they have clear flaws they have clear insecurities every character has a clear insecurity and a clear thing motivating them and it's, you could you could know these people in your real life and it's it's really refreshing and it's really nice and the side characters remain until the end until the fifth book that i hated they remain my favorite part of the story with the world So that was my five star review of The Painted Man. Not a book without flaws, but I loved it. I loved it despite those flaws. So in this book, we used three characters to, to discover three parts of the world. Arlen talks us about the magic and the implications of the threat to the demons and the magic's power against them. Nisha taught us about the everyman and the world and how the mundane works, which is so much different than our mundane, it becomes interesting. And then Roger teaches us about the politics and the conflicts of kings clashing and magic and propaganda and storytelling. Which one of these three parts is most important or is most valuable in a story? I don't know. So if we look at the three major fantasy series out there at the top of my head right now, Game of Thrones focuses on Roger, focuses on politics. And then Wheel of Time is more mundane world. Every culture is different. Every people is different. And this is who they are. And this is where they come from. And then Lord of the Rings is all magic system and big and grand and good versus evil so that's more of an island side of things so 
Which side do you prefer? Which side do you think the focus should be on? Because it's definitely interesting how Peter D. Brett chose to take each side so that he could get the best of all three of his worlds. Tell me in the comment section below. I'd love to have a talk about it. Like, subscribe. I'll see you next week.